Yes, it's coming okay. up fine. All right, good, good. All right, we're rocking and rolling then. All right. So uh, what I do want to mention out here, if I if I confuse you with a topic that I cover today, because I'll cover quite a few things fairly quickly, uh, feel free to email me or or contact me through list either one, and I'll be glad to try to answer any questions I can. I'm not a CPA. I don't do taxes for a living, but I've spent the last 15 years helping teach tax seminars to tax preparers. So I've uh, run across a few things along the way. So hopefully I can point out a few things that'll help you and, and help uh, the folks that you work with each year, each year as you're working through these sort of things. All right, so let's rock on into it. First, I want to start out with some just some general thoughts. And that is number one, a lot of tax deductions are missed because folks don't have the records or the receipts or the information to share with their tax preparer to prove that they've got the expenses or the deductions that they ought to have. So those good records are important for doing our taxes, but they're also important on doing some long range planning. And I'll get into after a while why that's even more important because having that long range plan, those of us that work with the farm management program know that a lot of times that helps us make decisions on down the road that'll hopefully make the farm operation more profitable. If it's more profitable, then we got to do even a better job keeping our records for our taxes to make sure we're not having to pay extra taxes on that extra income that we might make down the road. So I always have to plug our managed program just for a little bit that Les and I work with and, uh, and the others across the state <coughs> help farm families all the time, assist them with developing farm plans that'll hopefully enable them to make their operation all it can be down the road. Well, let's go to get on into the tax information. Now, here's what I'm going to try to cover today. So I've got a lot on the list. I'm going to go through a lot of it fairly quickly. Uh, I'm not going to wear you out with a whole bunch of numbers and statistics. I'll share a few along the way, but I'm not going to beat you to death with that sort of information. But I hope, as again, what to point out is some tips along the way that might uh, help you as we uh, look at some of this information. But let me jump on into the topics. Well, number one, let's talk a little bit about current tax issues. <coughs> With right now and probably one of the more common questions I'm getting right now are what about these payments that a lot of farmers have gotten this year, this Coronavirus Food Assistance Act payments, the CFAP, SCFAP payments, the CFAP1, and now CFAP2 that a lot of folks are applying for <laughs> currently. What's our situation with those? And pretty much like most all disaster type payments that provided from the federal government, those will be taxable income. Currently, we assume that they're going to send you a 1099 like they do for other types of tax payments. You'll provide that to your tax preparer. Or you'll use the information off of it if you do it yourself to, uh, to uh, fill out your tax forms. <coughs> so those will be, as far as we know now, taxable income. Uh, there have been some of the, uh, the COVID-19 type you know, stimulus payments for some businesses that uh, were able to be written that they weren't always taxable income if the money was used in certain ways. That's not true necessarily with these CFAP payments that farmers have gotten this year. Other, just some other general statistics for you there. Standard deduction this year does get adjusted each year for inflation. So this year, a single person gets the, a standard deduction of 12,200. Married filing joints, you get 24,400. Uh, head of household is 18,350 uh, for 2020. Uh, as you know, the personal exemption was done away with a few years ago. It's still done away with. It's zero. Uh, the current law reads that it will stay that way until 2025. Uh, so they could bring it back. They could leave it, you know, not around anymore. Uh, it kind of made, it, that was one of the reasons. All right, now you've got my sound back. I lost, I got uh, there, it, it disappeared for a second. Hopefully <laughs> you can hear me again. All right, let me jump back a little bit here. I know I, know I got ahead of myself just a little bit. Uh, so we've got this, the uh, personal exemptions gone. Tax rates this year, 10% bracket. Uh, that is that is your of your taxable income, not your gross income or anything. That's the taxable part of your income. Obviously, the 10% and 12% bracket covers a great majority of the folks because married, filing, joint, that covers almost up to $79,000 at $78,950. And then, of course, you jump up to the 22% bracket that uh, 
that goes on up to the $168,000 level. And then of course we've got brackets above that, that a smaller percentage of the people get caught up in those higher brackets. But if you're lucky enough to be there, I guess that's your challenge. We do still get a deduction for our sales tax in Tennessee. They did limit it. They call it the SALT deduction, which is the state and local tax deduction. For states that have income taxes, of course, they get to deduct part of their state income tax off of their federal return. In Tennessee, of course, we get to deduct a, a portion of our sales tax that we pay, which helps a little bit. It does have a maximum of $10,000 or $5,000 if you're married, file, and separate. But uh, we still do have that. Now, the key thing there is a person wants to keep up with any major purchases you have that you pay sales tax on. For example, if you bought a car or major appliances or something like that in a particular year, it's good to keep track of those because you can you can take a standard value that the uh, a lot of the income tax software calculates for you of what your what your average person would spend for sales tax in a year uh, based on our tax rate and that sort of thing or you can keep track of some of those larger items and add that up to a higher number so it gives you a little larger deduction. It's worth keeping up with those bigger items because of that. One of the big topics I wanna to hit today is an issue we ran into a few years ago that we found out a lot of tax preparers as well as a lot of farm folks don't know about an issue that's being created if they incorrectly report sales of livestock. We found that a lot of folks are reporting their, their livestock sales as one number, you know, I sold so many thousand dollars worth of calves to their tax preparer and the tax preparer puts it on a form. Sometimes they are mixing sales of their calves that they raised or calves that they bought and resold with their breeding livestock. And that's a major mistake, or it can be in some situations. So I want to cover some information about that uh, particularly. Basically, you've got two major types of livestock being sold. You've got the calves you raise or calves that you bought and resold, and you've got breeding livestock. And those calves need to be separated when you report them to the tax preparer based on whether you raised them or whether you bought and resold them because that uh, changes how they're reported on Schedule F. We'll talk more about that in a second. And the breeding livestock similarly needs to be reported based on whether it was a, calf, a heifer that you raised from a calf and she became part of the breeding herd or whether it was a cow or a bred heifer that you bought and you kept her in the herd for a number of years and then you resold her to somebody or sold her to somebody else. And so reporting those needs to be done separately so that your tax preparer can keep this right on your tax return. Uh, there is a publication we wrote on this uh, last year. Uh, it's extension publication D42 that in three pages covers what I'm about to cover. But if you need a paper copy or want to share a copy with your tax preparer, it might be a, a handy thing to, to go online and print off or, or get a copy of from your local extension office. All right, moving right along. Good old Schedule F, the, and I'm not going to wear you out with this thing, but I want to mention just a couple things. This is Schedule F, the form that taxes for farming is, is the majority of the numbers that you keep track of every year gets uh, put on to return, do your tax return. And I know most folks use computer software, but the computer software is going to basically plug it in in this same information. But to look at the table a little bit, it's good to look at part one. The upper part of this form is primarily the income that comes in from the farm. You know, what did you sell? What, you know, why did you generate the dollars? The lower half of it, part two, is where did all the expenses go? The feed, the seed, the fertilizer, the chemicals that you spend money on, those items that you can deduct those expenses as farm expenses, they're going to go in the lower half of this. I'm going to point out some particular parts, especially about the income side of this, that I want to make you aware of today related to these livestock sales. I've enlarged that upper part of it and you can see the key things about income sales from what you sell on the farm is lines one a b c and line two so line two is the one for you know and we'll talk more about that but when you're reporting income from calves you sold they go on lines a b or one a b c or line two there is another line on here I'll probably mention it again line eight that just says other income too often I find somebody has reported sales of breeding livestock either on lines two, one, A, B, C, and two, or on line eight. And I'll say this more than once in the next few minutes, breeding livestock does not go on schedule F. It goes on a different form. We'll talk more about that in a second. Let's run through some examples and you'll see what I'm talking about here. All right, example one, guy raises some calves, gets them up to about 500 pounds and he sells them. 
Well, he can deduct the cost, obviously the, duct, the cost of raising those calves are gonna be included on his Schedule F, what it costs him to feed them, to buy the mineral, the animal health and all that. He's gonna deduct that on Schedule F. He can also deduct the marketing cost. What did it cost to transport them to the sales barn? What did it cost at the sales barn to sell them? What was their fees? All of that can go on Schedule F as well. So that'll reduce his income from selling that group of calves. But the income from that group of calves that he sold will go on part one of Schedule F under line number two, because these are calves or livestock that he raised. Real simple, he puts the income there on number two. All those expenses are gonna go down in the lower part of Schedule F. Well, another example, what if he bought some calves? Let's say he bought some calves that weighed about 250 pounds, put a little weight on them, fed them a little bit, kept them healthy, got them up to about 500 pounds and then sold them. Well, what's he gonna do with that income and that expense? And you may recall, and you've probably heard this before, when you buy calves and resell them, you can't deduct the cost of the sale until uh, the cost of their purchase until you sell them. So in other words, if you bought calves today, but you're not gonna sell them till next March, you can't take the, you can't deduct the expense of buying those calves this fall when you're planning on reselling them next spring. You, you would take that away when you sell them next spring. That does two things. One, it doesn't overload your expenses this year and it doesn't overload your income next year. So you probably wouldn't wanna deduct that cost until then, uh, but in you know, one of those things it's not allowed. There again, expenses of their care and their feed and all that, while you've got them, you deduct all that on Schedule F. But when you report that income for those calves that you bought and resold, it goes on lines 1A, B, and C. What you sell them for goes on line 1A. What you paid for them when you bought them goes on line 1B that you subtract then from 1A, and you have the, basically the net income from those calves that shows up on line 1C. Those two are pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Most folks get those parts pretty right most of the time. The key thing here is we don't want any income from breeding livestock to show up in those blanks, nor do we want it to show up on line eight other under in income because the income that goes on schedule F is subject to in income tax, it's also subject to self-employment tax. So if there's a profit on the farm that year, you're gonna pay in self-employment tax as well as income tax on that income. And again, breeding livestock don't go here. I'll show you in a moment where they go. They go, as this bottom line points out, they go on form 4797. That is the same form that you use when you're selling other assets because breeding livestock are considered an asset to the farm. They're just like a tractor or a bush hog or anything else. When you sell them, it's an asset that you're selling. Now, how the tax treatment is noted on those breeding livestock depends on a few things. Number one, did you raise it or did you buy it? If it's a cow that you or a heifer that you bought, you are able to take depreciation on that. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. If it's a cow that, or, that you raised from a calf and you kept her as a heifer and then you bred her and she became part of the cow herd, then that's handled a little bit differently. How long you've owned the animal changes how it's reported on the farms as well. If it's owned on the farm by more, for more than 24 months, obviously a calf that you've raised up and then became a cow, you're obviously gonna have her there most likely more than 24 months. One that you've bought and then resold later, you might or might not have her there that long, but it's considered a long-term gain when you sell a, an animal that you've owned on the farm for more than 24 months. And then that gain of selling those animals is combined with other gains and losses. So if you have other animals you sold or other equipment you sold or other things that are considered assets that go on form 4797, then those get combined together. So you may well come up with a total net gain or net loss for the sale of all those items for that particular year. All right couple more examples we'll talk about. I'm not going to try to show you all of Form 4797. It's fairly involved, little three pages to it, but uh, there is more direct information about it in a publication the IRS puts out every year called the Farmer's Tax Guide. It's publication 225. It's a fairly long publication. It's about 80 some pages as I recall, but they update it each fall. I have not seen the version for 2020 yet. Uh, they usually get it out about the first week of December somewhere along in there. So it would, should be out within the next you know, four to five weeks, hopefully, with any luck. All right. 
What about sales of the breeding livestock? Where do they go on this form 4797? So here's a couple quick examples. Number one, Farmer C had a four-year-old cow that he raised. He sold her for $1,100. His expenses from that sale was about 125 bucks. Uh, the transportation or the market expense, whatever you want to call it. So he subtracts the 125 from the 1100. Now he's got a gain on that sale of $975. It's a long-term gain because he's had her for more than 24 months. And so that gain, as I mentioned earlier, gets combined with other gains and losses for the years, gets reported on Form 4797. Now here's the one that usually throws folks off the most. Example four, Farmer D, he's got a cow that he bought four years ago. He's kept her in the herd for four years. He bought her for $1,300, and he was lucky enough to turn around and sell her four years later for $1,250. He's taken depreciation on that cow for the last four years, a total of $867 worth of depreciation. And again, his expenses of selling the cow was about 125 bucks. So we calculate that one this way. If we look at the left-hand side numbers, his original cost was 1300 We add to that his cost of selling the cow. That adds to his value of the cow because it costs the seller that. And he subtracts then that depreciation that he's been taking. So he comes out with an adjusted basis or an adjusted value for tax purposes in that cow of $558. He subtracts that $558 from the $1,250, and he's now got a gain realized on the sale of that one cow of $692. So his gain's not the entire $1,250. And if you'd have put that whole 1250 back on Schedule F, it would have showed up there as an as a, as a income on there, where his gain showing on this Form 4797 is only the $692. All right, here's where this becomes important. And here's my example here, that if Farmer D had mistakenly reported that 1250 over on Schedule F, and he didn't report any basis or value in that cow, that entire amount, $1,250, is going to be ordinary income that's subject to both income tax and self-employment tax. Now, here I drew an assumption and said, well, this farmer's got income from another source. He's got a job in town that's going to put him in about the 10% tax bracket. Plus, you know, or maybe he's got enough income off the farm that he's in a 10% tax bracket. Well, if he reported that sale incorrectly and the whole $1,250 went on Schedule F as income rather than reporting it the right way, then he's going to pay 10% tax on it. He's also going to pay up to 15.3% self-employment tax. It might not be quite that much because of the deductions we get on the self-employment tax, but that could amount to $300 in extra taxes on the sale of one cow. So this, and while that's a little bit of a, uh, a rare occurrence to be that high, it could, it could happen. So that's why it's important that this gets reported correctly by you to your tax preparer or get puts on your forms correctly. Now, one of the other questions I often get, well, what if I have a loss on the farm? Is this still a big deal? Well, it can be because if you've got, excuse me, if you've got off farm income that that farm loss is reducing, so you pay less income tax. If that 1250 gets reported on Schedule F incorrectly, then it's raising the farm income. So the farm income is actually higher than it should be if it was reported correctly. So you're not offsetting as much of the all farm income. So it's still, while you might not be paying self-employment tax because the farm had a loss itself, you may be paying more income tax than you would have otherwise. So to me, this is a biggie. Uh, there are some other things we need to think about with this. And here's some of those. There are some specific rules related to this. One, we talked about the holding period already, that it's a 24-month holding period uh, that these are considered a long-term gain, if that's the case, for cattle and horses. It's 12 months for other livestock like hogs, sheep, and goats. Some other rules that are good to know related to this is, one, there are some exceptions to this holding period rule. If the sale was because of a weather-related event, the weather-related event might be a drought we have one summer. It could be related to a storm that came through, and you, or it could be uh, sales because of a, uh, you know, a tornado, whatever. But basically, if a weather-related event causes a farmer to sell additional breeding livestock above what he would have, or, or other calves for that matter, and you can show typically it's related to breeding livestock. Let's say, for example, we have a drought one summer. As a quick example here. We have a drought one summer, you're going to run out of pasture. You know you're going to have enough pasture. You've got to cull the cow herd down to get through the year. And normally in an average good year, you sell out about 10 cull cows. 
But this year, because it's too dry, you realize you're gonna have to cull out some extras, you cull out 15. So you've culled out five extra cows. The income from those five additional cows don't have to show up on your income tax form at all that year because of this weather-related event. And the law states that you have up to two years to replace those breeding livestock and not have to show worry about reporting that income at all. What it does say is if you replace them with uh, cows that cost less than what you sold those extra five for, then you'd have to claim the difference as income. If the new cows cost more, then obviously you get to depreciate their value since you purchased these new cows and you don't have to worry about that income that you had from those that you sold, those extras that you sold the years before. Good to know that when it comes in handy in a drought year especially, it can come in and some folks, and I know this year we've had some tornadoes throughout Tennessee, some folks may have had to, didn't, you know, lost fencing and had to maybe move some cattle because of a weather related event, could come into play there too. Two other neat rules that come into play here also related to this is one, I like this middle one, if an animal is raised with the intent for it to become breeding livestock and it is determined later that the animal is sterile, and the animal is sold within a reasonable time, it could be considered breeding livestock. So you've got a heifer, you've been raising her up from a calf, she's now about ready to breed. For whatever reason, you know, either she doesn't breed and you have the vet checker or whatever, you find out she's, she's, not, she's a non-breeder. And you decide to sell her. Well, I can't find a definition of what a reasonable time is. I, how the IRS defines that, I don't know. But in my mind, if you sold her within a few weeks or maybe within a month of when you found out she was sterile, then that would seem reasonable to me. Hopefully it would to them too. But obviously if you kept her for another six to nine months and tried to fatten her up a little, well, maybe she's no longer breeding livestock. She's a calf you're fattening up. So you gotta watch that a little bit. I don't know who's gonna check on you, but you know, at the same time, but that would save you the, and allow you to put the income on schedule 4797 as breeding livestock and would prevent you from having to pay self-employment tax on that income. The other one that I think is neat is this last one on the screen is if a farmer is selling an entire herd of animals, generally, I'll let, the IRS uses that word generally a lot, generally they could consider the younger animals that would have become breeding livestock as such for tax purposes. So if he's got a group of heifers that are, you know, nine to 12 months old that he's raising to become part of the herd, but for whatever reason he decides to retire and just sell the whole herd, he could claim those younger animals as being breeding livestock for tax purposes, again, saving some tax dollars. Good to know those little oddball rules that we don't run across too often in case it comes into play. That one's really important for a farmer that's retiring and maybe selling the whole farm too. So here's the summary to this. Your livestock sales need to be reported to your tax preparer four ways. Calves you raised, calves that you bought and resold, that you purchased and resold, breeding livestock that you raised, and then breeding livestock that you purchased and then sold later on. Make sure your tax preparer understands that. If he doesn't seem to have a clue about it, he or she, then you might wanna give them a copy of that publication D42. And if they still don't get it, well, maybe it's time to look for a different tax preparer. Hopefully you won't have that problem. All right, some more topics I wanna hit on this year just to provide some tips to you that may help bring you up to date on a few things. We've had some tax law changes in the last few years, and here's a couple of those on this screen. Number one is new equipment. You buy a brand new tractor, if you choose to depreciate that tractor, you can depreciate it now over five years. The old rule was seven years. So we can depreciate it quicker if we want to use standard depreciation. Used equipment that you buy is still seven years. So that, that part hadn't changed. These next two are key to whether or not you're using the depreciation. Back when they did the Tax Cut and Jobs Acts in 2017 that went in effect in 2018, we, they, they bumped bonus depreciation to 100% through the year 2022. What that means is basically if you bought that new tractor, you could probably, if you want to, write off the whole darn thing in one year using bonus depreciation in many cases. It does say that bonus depreciation is only for new equipment. The other catch to it is it's, all, it's, it's for all equipment in that particular, what they call recovery class. So for example, tractors, new tractors, five-year equipment. New cows that join the herd, five-year recovery class. There are a lot of other assets. Uh, a, I think a truck is in a five-year class as well. So you, if you choose not to use bonus depreciation, it has to be for everything in that class. So in other words, you can't, 
choose to buy a tractor and a bush hog and use bonus depreciation for the tractor, but not use it for the bush hog because they're both in the same, if they're both new equipment, they're both in the same recovery class. You can't pick and choose on that. So it's all or nothing with bonus depreciation for that class of assets. Uh, again, the other thing to mention is the bonus depreciation is scheduled to drop to 80% in 2023, goes down to 60% in 2024, and so on until it goes away. I have read a report recently that says it might be possible for some used equipment to qualify for bonus depreciation. Get this now, if I understand this right, and this is tricky, if the current owner and the previous owner had not claimed any depreciation on it in the last five years. Now, I'm not, I don't know how you're gonna find that, but that might be possible. I'm sure your tax preparer will be checking up on that sort of thing to see if that's a possibility. Usually the bonus depreciation is used on new stuff only anyway. You also have the ability to use section 179 deduction, which allows you to write off the cost of assets. It does have a maximum amount of a million and 20,000 a year. Most of us don't hit that with farming. Uh, some of the large operations might. Section 179 is on an individual asset basis. So you could choose with it, if you choose not to use bonus depreciation, you could choose to use section 179 for a tractor, and not choose to use it for the bush hog. So you can choose based on each item. Section 179 cannot create a loss for the year of the farming operation. Bonus depreciation can. So a little bit of a difference there. So a lot of times folks will write the whole thing off in one year. And if it's a high income year, that makes good sense. If it's not a high income year, if it's a so-so year or a low income year, it may be time to think about whether or not you really want to use bonus depreciation or even section 7179 at all, because especially if you think future years might have better income or if future years might have a higher tax rate, and that is a possibility because we're at a fairly low tax rate now, you might want to depreciate the item over the five or seven years or whatever class it fits into rather than using bonus depreciation or schedule or section 179. The other thing that they added a couple of years ago, I don't want to forget about is small equipment under $2,500 can be expensed all in one year. So if you've just got a few small pieces of equipment you bought, a chainsaw or you know some little something that's under 2,500, you can write all that off in one year and not have to worry about utilizing bonus depreciation or section 179 for those. So the other thing I like to point out here every time I talk about assets and purchasing them is I always say, an asset shouldn't be purchased just to get the depreciation. I've, I've heard tax preparers even say, well, you ought to go buy a tractor so you can write that off this year and reduce your taxes. Well, that's wonderful and it might reduce your taxes, but that's not gonna be enough to pay for that whole tractor. So somebody's still gotta make the payments on that tractor if there's not enough cash on hand to do it. So just buying something to get the depreciation may not be a good reason to do it. It may be you need to think about that asset that you're buying and will it save you labor? Will it reduce expenses? Will it make the farm more efficient? Does it make sense that you need that new tractor versus the one you've got? Well, there are sometimes there are good reasons, but you need to check, double check some of that sort of stuff. All right, other tidbits today. One of the questions I get often, well, if I get audited, what are auditors looking for when they audit a farm return? And here's kind of the list of things that they list in their audit information that they're looking for. And number one is, and, and realize they're getting a little pickier on what they call hobby farms. The last two or three years, I've seen more articles from the IRS about looking for hobby farms and trying to prove that people are just using farms as a tax write-off rather than actually trying to make money on the farm, make, make a profit. So number one, they look for proof of a profit motive. What are you doing? with that operation to make it profitable. And there's a variety of ways they look at that or how they determine that is one, do you have a business or farm plan? Do you have something in writing that says, okay, this is what I'm doing now. This is what I'm planning on doing two years, three years, five, 10 years down the road. This is how I'm gonna make this farm more profitable. Do you have that written somewhere? Do you have a farm plan? And of course, that's one of the things that folks uh, like Les and I do uh, every day for farm folks out there is, is help them develop farm plans. Uh, luckily, we've got a software program that helps us do it. So uh, we can still provide that service, of course. Do you separate the farm records from the household records? Do you have a separate checking account for the farm? that you work out of separate from the, the home checking account. They look for that sort of thing as proof that your farm is trying to act like a business and, and become profitable. Uh, 
Have you uh, attempted to get additional education or training to make you better able, a better manager of the farm? Obviously, attending something like today might count in that list, but uh, what have you done to make yourself a better manager of that farm to make it more profitable? They, the IRS auditors look for that. And then what changes or improvements have you made over time to make that farm become profitable? Now, obviously, the, they're going to give you some leeway. A lot of farm operations, they know you've got a lot of startup costs the first couple of years of a new farm, especially, or if you've taken on a huge new enterprise, you just built a, uh, a new facility out there that goes with part of the farm, a new building or whatever it might be, that's going to be a major expense for a few years. How has that helped make the farm profitable in time? So have those changes, what are those changes done that will make the farm better, you might say? And then one of the other things the auditors are obviously going to look for is, is there a high off-farm income? Uh, they're going to look at the doctors and the lawyers and the, you know, the high income folks and say, well, you know, if they've got a farm out there, are they really trying to manage that farm as a farm? Or are they just trying to lose money on the farm to reduce their other income? They're going to look at that as well. We have seen a little higher percentage of audits on the, what they call hobby farms the last years. It's not been that much because the overall audit percentages is pretty low because the IRS has been so shorthanded the last few years. But it's good to have some of that information hand just to know what they would be looking for. All right, some other tax reducing tips I want to throw in that might help you out as you go through the year and the future years is one thing that can be done that some folks utilize sometimes is prepaying expenses. In other words, you could purchase feed, fertilizer, seed, something like that. Now, write the expense off in 2020, but it's for an item you're not going to need till next spring. You could pre-purchase fertilizer that you're going to use when you plant the corn or soybeans next spring. You get the deduction in 2020, and then you're going to have to, the, the, the fertilizer, you're not going to get it from the farm supply until next spring. The key thing here with the IRS is it must be a purchase, not a deposit. So when you buy that, you know, 10 ton of 5, 10, 15, it needs to say that on the ticket that you're using as a receipt for that expense that you're going to deduct. It can't say that you paid them $10,000 for fertilizer you're going to get next year. It's got to, it can't be a deposit. It's got to be an actual purchase. Now, that's not to say that next spring you look at your soil sample and say, oh, I don't need 5, 10, 15. I need triple 10. You could change it. That's not a big deal because you've still purchased one thing. The fact that you altered the actual ingredients when you got it, that I don't think is a problem to the IRS. It just has to be on that receipt that it's a purchase, not a deposit. Well, some other tax saving tips that some farmers utilize is paying their children. Children that are, you know, children of the farmer, if it's, a, if it's a soil proprietorship, that farmer has his own operation, he can pay a child that's of his that's under 18 and you don't have to withhold any self-employment tax. So you don't have to withhold the Social Security and the Medicare taxes from their pay. Now, obviously, they may still have to pay income tax on that income where they would file their own income tax return if it's over a certain dollar amount. If that child is a dependent, they are still allowed a, as of this year, a $1,100 standard deduction, not that 12,200 that a single individual would get because they are a dependent, they don't get that 12,200, they'd only get 1,100. But so if they're paid less than 1,100, they would not even have to file a return. But over that 1,100, they could, they'd have to pay income tax on it, but the tax bracket of the child may be lower than the tax bracket of the farmer. So that is a possibility. Uh, works the same way with spouses too, by the way. Income averaging is a tool available to farmers that other businesses aren't allowed. It's a way that if you have a high income year, some of that income can be spread back into the previous two or three years to kind of average out that income. Uh, it works really well when you have a really good year and you've had a couple weak years or bad years prior to that as a means of saving some tax dollars. Uh, it doesn't work quite as well in reverse. If you've had two really good years and then have a bad year, it, doesn't, uh, it may not be worth the time to do the calculations to figure out what it would save you. Uh, if it will lower, if it will get those previous, those old years to the bad years to shift income into a lower tax bracket, that's where it saves you money. So if you're bumping up into say a 22% tax bracket, but the previous two years you were only in a 10% bracket and you could shift income back into those 10% bracket years without bumping them to a higher bracket, then that's where the savings occurs. It does take some calculations to do that. Not a real common occurrence, but it could occur. 
Other things you can sometimes do is deferring disaster or crop insurance payments. What you have to be able to, let's say that you have a, a you know, a, a hurricane or, you know, let's say a tornado comes right through the middle of your farm and wipes out your corn crop and your corn crops just, just it's gone, you know. So you've got insurance, crop insurance on that, on that corn. If you can show that it is your normal practice not to sell that corn in the year of harvest, but that you typically store it and sell it in the next year or a majority of it in the next year, then it's possible when you get that insurance payment for that crop, that disaster insurance payment, that you can defer that insurance payment to the next year when you would have got the income from selling the corn. Uh, there again, it has to be a normal practice that you're showing that you do that. A lot of folks do that, store their corn and then sell it the next year or st st uh, store a good majority of it. Uh, one other thing I want to mention here, just because it's a, one that's often overlooked, is sometimes when we're having a tough year, farmers will sell off a little timber. Well, unfortunately, timber prices aren't too great right now, so not as many folks may be doing that, but still some are. One of the key things I always like to remind folks of, make sure that you have a basis or value established in that timber, because you can subtract that basis from what you get for the timber. Now, how do you establish a basis in timber? Well, it's typically done when you buy, purchase the land that the timber's on, or you inherit the land. That's the best time to do it, because then you can calculate a value for the land and calculate a value for the timber separate from the land, and that's how you create a basis in that timber. It might require that you have to get a forester to come out and look at the timber and say, well, you got this many dollars of oak and this many dollars of pine and so many board feet that are out there, and give you a value for that timber. If you've never done that, it's still possible, if it hasn't been a long, long time, by that I mean eh, if it's been 10 years or less since you've obtained that track of land, it may be worth time to have a, a, a timber consultant look at it and do what's called a back cruise and go back in time and calculate what that timber would have been worth when you inherited it or bought it versus what you've sold it for now. And that could still save you some tax dollars. Depending on the value of the timber, how many acres we're talking about, it may be worth paying that consultant the, whatever that cost to get that basis so that you can reduce your taxes. There again, it's kind of a one-by-one on, one one situation you have to look at there. I like to mention that because it can be significant if you've got a lot of timber you're selling at any one time. Other rules that's changed a little bit the last years I want to make sure I mention, one's called like-kind exchange. Like-kind exchange is most commonly comes into play when you're change, exchanging land or assets such as land and buildings for other land and buildings. So in other words, if you've got a track of land out in the, you know, the, you know, the back 40 you don't need anymore and you're gonna swap off some acreage there for this fellow that's got an apartment building in town, you can do what's called a like kind exchange and you don't have to claim the income from the sale of your land and he doesn't have to claim the sale of the apartment building and you basically do a swap or like kind exchange. There are some very specific rules because only real estate can do like kind exchanges now. It used to be that when we traded in a tractor at the local you know, equipment dealer, we traded in the tractor. And it was essentially a like kind exchange because we traded in the tractor and they said, okay, we'll give you $20,000 for your old tractor. And you're gonna buy a new tractor that's costing $100,000. The old way of doing that was you subtracted the 20 from the 100,000 and now you had $80,000 in that new tractor. Uh, you might have to make some adjustments for depreciation and that sort of thing, but generally that's what you did. And it was considered a like kind exchange. They did away with that. Basically now, if you sell a tractor or trade in a tractor, let's say you trade in that same tractor for 20,000, you have to show on your taxes just like you sold it for 20,000 and adjust for any depreciation that was taken on the tractor or may have to what they call recapture some of the depreciation in that sale. And that there again, that goes on that form 4797 we've talked about. Then when you take that new tractor that you've paid 100,000 for, you get to depreciate or deduct that entire 100,000, whether you use bonus depreciation, section 179, or you depreciate it out over five years or longer, then you get to use that full $100,000. This actually has been a win-win for most folks because usually the additional taxes you would owe from selling the tractor is a lot less than the deduction you get from having the higher value now in the new tractor. So it's, it's a good thing. Plus, it often reduces self-employment tax 
because the sale of that tractor that's lower now gets thrown over there as sale of a, a an item on 4797 that you don't pay self-employment tax on but that deduction on that lar larger amount now on the new tractor gets to reduce your farm income that reduces self-employment tax. So it's usually come out better off because they changed that one. Not, it wasn't, wasn't an all bad thing. All right, another deduction you may or may not be aware of that's been around since 2018 is one called the QBID, the Qualified Business Income Deduction. It replaced one that we'd had for a few years called the DPAD, the Domestic Production Activities Deduction. The problem we had with DPAD is a lot of farms didn't qualify it because one of the restrictions was you had to be paying labor. And if you didn't have hired employees, you didn't qualify for DPAD. Well, when they wrote the rules for the new QBID, the Qualified Business Income Deduction, it doesn't have that stipulation about paying labor in it, so most farms qualify for it. You do have to have a profit uh, to be able to qualify because it's a 20% deduction of the profit or the adjusted gross income off the farm. So it, it just knocks 20% right off the income. Not a bad deal. And as I say, most farms do qualify if they had a profit that year. Obviously, no profits, you don't get a deduction. That one makes sense. But a lot of folks didn't know about that one and didn't catch it right when they were answering the questions if they were doing their own uh, taxes on their own return on some software. Because uh, I knew, I talked to a, a lady that had done her own return two years ago now, and she said, I didn't get a QBID deduction. I don't know why. And, you know, we talked about it some, and she went back and looked, and she had answered a question wrong on her tax return that she had done in her you know, software, and it had knocked her out of getting the QBID deduction that she should have gotten. All right, other things, this one may or may not come into play as a net operating loss. We do have some advantages in farming there as well, but it's gotta be a significant loss to amount to anything for you. Basically, if you've got a net operating loss, you get to, that loss offsets other income if you've got other income, or you can use that loss to carry back, in some cases, to previous years, if you had income in those years. So a farmer is allowed to carry back a net operating loss. Now there is a maximum amount per year for net operating loss. It's 250,000 for a single return, 500,000 for married filing joint. That doesn't hit too many folks, but it could in a really bad year. You can carry forward a net operating loss indefinitely until you use it up because it can offset you know, net income in, in those previous two years or in future years. The net operating loss carried forward can only offset up to 80% of income. So you can't offset all future income with a net operating loss, but it can be used to offset up to 80%. Basically, in most of the calculations, it's easier to carry it forward because if you carry it into a backwards into a previous year, you've got to file that return again uh, for that previous year to get that you know, that deduction then, or you might say, or that, that credit you get, or that uh, refund. Uh, Non-farms, other businesses, they're not allowed to carry back at all. So it's it's a real plus for farmers that if they need it, it's, it's, it's not a bad thing. So we do get a few breaks tax-wise for farming, though we don't get near as many as we'd like to have. All right, something related here, but not exactly income tax, but it can impact your income taxes. And this is related to a state income, state, a state tax. So a lot of folks, I talk to farmers quite often that are thinking about retiring and they're talking about, you know, they're gonna redo their their, their will and, and all their plans for, for their estate plan. And they're worried about paying estate taxes. Well, the majority of us don't have to worry about estate taxes because we don't have an estate tax or inheritance tax in Tennessee anymore. Thank goodness they did away with that a few years ago. There is still a federal estate tax but you only pay estate tax at the federal level if your estate is worth more than $11,580,000. So if you pass away in 2020, unless your estate's bigger than that, there will be no estate tax paid after you're gone. And with proper planning, a husband and wife or a couple can double that amount so that the amount that's not used by one carries over to the next. So you could get over $23 million, uh, basically, of a state without being taxed. Uh, you know, if that's your problem, uh, I'm, you're, you're fortunate, obviously. But anyway, uh, my favorite statement there is if that's gonna be a problem for you, you can adopt me. I'll try to take care of you best you can. All right, uh, going on with that, the SECURE Act in passed in 2019 changed a few things related to retirement 
savings accounts like IRAs and 401ks. The biggie here was it changed starting this year in 2020. It used to be that if you had an IRA, the year that you turned 70 and one half, you had to start taking required minimum distributions, what's called RMDs, payments from that IRA or that 401k. They changed the law this year, so now you don't have to start taking RMDs until the year you turn 72. Now, some people will say, well, but the law says I don't have to wait, I can wait till I'm 73. Technically you can, but I'll tell you, you don't want to because the year you turn 72, it says you've got to take the RMD by the next April. If you wait until sometime in the next year, then you're gonna to have to take that RMD pay tax on that one and you're still going to have to take another one during that next year. So you don't want two of them in one year. So the year you turn 72, you have to start taking the RMDs, best way to go. The bad side of the law change was they changed the laws to beneficiaries. So if you make your son the beneficiary of your IRA, when you pass away, he inherits your IRA or what's left in it. It used to be that the son or daughter or, or any child could consider that a beneficiary IRA and they didn't have to take that whole amount out in any particular period of time, they could spread it over their lifetime. Like the distributions that required minimum distribution for you is calculated based on your age and how many years they expect you to live out from that, they could recalculate it on a, as a beneficiary IRA based on their age. They changed, did, basically they did away with that. The new rule states that if, if someone inherits an IRA there are only a couple exceptions to this. They have to withdraw that money from that IRA within 10 years. Now, if it's a traditional IRA, which means that income is going to be taxable, if you had a substantial amount of money in your IRA and your son inherits it, and he's got, you know, let's say it's $100,000, he's got 10 years to take that money out. He can take it a little bit each year for the 10 years, so he could take 10,000 a year and use it up, or he can wait to the end of the 10th year and take the full 100,000 plus whatever interest is gained in the meanwhile. Obviously, he'd want to spread it out so it wouldn't change his income tax bracket too much, but obviously an extra 10,000 to some folks would jump them into a higher tax bracket. If it's an even bigger IRA, you can, you can see how that could be an issue. Uh, but you've got basically heirs other than spouses have to take it out within the 10 years. There is a couple other exceptions if it's a minor child or if it's a disabled child. There are some exceptions that might allow a little longer than the 10 years. Uh, but in most cases, that's the new rule on that one. All right, other things I just wanna emphasize as I'm wrapping up here is the better job you can keep your records, the better job you can do in your taxes and the better your tax preparer can do for you. Uh, they charge for the hour, most of them, or they have a kind of a set rates based on how long it's going to take them to do certain forms. And so if they know that you're going to walk in there with a really good set of records that are going to have just about everything they need to put on Schedule F and the other forms that they need to fill out for you, they're not going to stick you with higher fees that they might if you walk in there with a shoebox full of receipts and they have to spend hours sorting through that to figure out what goes into feed and what goes into seed and what's in fertilizer. So that's better. Doing a good job of separating the family and home expenses from the farm expenses helps them out as well. And I always say if you got whatever records keeping system you use, if you'll use it, it's a good one. But if you won't use it, it doesn't matter what it is. So whether you use a record book or, or a computer program like Quicken or QuickBooks or even just a spreadsheet to keep your records on, it doesn't matter as long as you're doing it. And if you need assistance with something like that, you can call on your county agent who will get you in touch with one of us area specialists and we'll try to help you set up a better system if we can at all. That will help you out in the long run. Les, I've covered a lot of ground in a little bit of time. So uh, I'll hush for a moment. If somebody's got a question, I'll try to answer it. Or if they are there again, if they want to email me one later on, I'll be glad to try to do it later on too.